Good evening. My name is Janice Nagel, and I am here with Lorna Teitelbaum, both of us from JFSA. Thank you for joining us tonight for understanding the college admissions process with presenters Lisa Myers and Crystal Russell. JFSA's mission is to help find solutions to face life's challenges with confidence, and tonight, the challenge is navigating the college admissions process. Our first presenter is Lisa Sinman Myers. She has spent her career in higher education as the senior admissions consultant with Road to College, a college admissions consulting firm. She has also worked as senior assistant director of admissions at Washington University, and she's interned in Case's admissions office while completing her master's. Lisa speaks as a professional and as a parent with a child in college and another going through the planning process. Crystal Russell is Director of Undergraduate Admission at Case Western Reserve University. She brings nearly 15 years of experience in higher education. Crystal has experience both on the high school side of the, of the aisle as well as college admissions. She's currently in her fourth and final year at Case assuming the duties as Dean of Admissions at Hampton Sydney College this May. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Crystal, for your time, uh, for your time joining us tonight. Just to let people know, we will be having you put questions into the Q&A box, and at the end of both presentations, we will um, moderate the questions. Thank you, and with that, we'll turn it over to Lisa. Terrific. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. All right. Hopefully you can see um, we have a presentation going. All right. Everything looks good to me. Um, and let's get going. There's a lot of information to cover. I am going to do my best to cover many topics that are related to navigating the college process. Um, as you heard in my introduction, I've spent uh, time on both the admission side and also in working with students directly on the application process. As an independent admissions consultant, I don't work for a particular university or for a particular high school. So I have the pleasure of working with students in Cleveland, across the US, and also internationally. The company that I work for is based in Boston. And I was a remote employee long before everybody else went remote. Um, the two big topics that I'm going to cover, which will hopefully answer many of the questions that you submitted, include finding the right type of college, in other words, the fit of the process, and standing out as a prospective student. I heard sage advice recently that boils down to two very short sentences, four words all together, ask questions and follow directions. Those are probably the most important pieces of advice that I can share with all of you. And I hope that that will be helpful to you um, as we discuss things tonight and also when Crystal speaks as well. So let's go ahead and get going. All right, finding the right fit. Fit is about putting together your college list. It's about looking beyond the rank of an institution. Um, we've all heard of things like the US News and World Report rankings and various other rankings that exist. I am very suspicious of rankings. I take them with a grain of salt. I think that it can be useful to a certain extent. But I'm also suspicious of how we rank institutions and how we think about uh, that side of things. Um, we can also think about things like perceived prestige and our own biases as we are, are thinking about fit in not necessarily the best ways. So we want to move beyond rank, perceived prestige, and our own biases when we're putting together the college list. The college list evolves throughout the entire process. The kinds of schools they, that a student may be thinking about at the beginning of the process, they may realize by the end of the process are not necessarily the right schools for them. My best example of this is the student who is really set on attending a Big Ten type university, um, a large school with a rah-rah culture and school spirit and a huge campus. 
And when that student actually visits a school like that, he or she may realize that that isn't the right place for them. So being open-minded is really important in this process. And knowing that the list can evolve and change is critical. A student, along with their parents, needs to think about building the list with intention. You're thinking about your home for the next four years. You're thinking about the place where you're gonna build your professional and social communities. You need to incorporate various priorities as you um, make this list. So finding the right fit for you, which might be very different than your older sibling, your cousin, your next door neighbor, um, that's gonna be very important. Okay, so when we talk about prioritizing preferences, there are many factors that are considered um, when you're thinking about priorities. They could be different majors that you're looking at, the size or the makeup of the student body, the location or size, not just of the, the college or university you're looking at, but also the uh, city or the location where the school is. So you need to think about what's most important to you about the college you attend. Um, what factors will shape your decision making? And obviously, what are your goals for the future? You need to recognize that prioritizing your preferences is a large determination of fit. And that's why this is a unique process. My older daughter's priorities in choosing a college were very different than what my younger daughter is thinking about. There's some overlap, but there's also differences. So even within a family, those priorities can be shifted. You wanna think about who you are today and who you want to become and what colleges will help you to get there. What skills do you need to develop yourself and to get yourself where you want to go, both academically, professionally, personally. Um, you need to think about academic su success, finding um, the balance of challenge and support, majors of your interest, and also things that go beyond your intended major. You might be thinking about the academic side of everything. Your social and emotional well-being, the social network that exists via clubs and organizations, support services, including tutoring, a writing center, accessible professors, mental health services, residential life, and the academic community, whether it's known as being competitive or collaborative. Those are all important factors to think about. And those will all determine your correct fit. But in order to do that, you need to start thinking about your personal strengths and areas of improvement. And so that brings us to this next step of self-reflection. This is critical in the process. I know many families that I've worked with where everyone is set to jump in and start making a list of colleges before they've even thought about priorities before they've done any reflection. And that self-reflection is largely gonna take place for the students, but I think there also needs to be some self-reflection of the parents. And we'll talk a little bit later on about why communication is so essential. So in evaluating your personal strengths, and I like to say areas of improvement rather than weaknesses, because we can always seek to improve in various um, ways, you need to think about things um, more critically. If you have a favorite subject, why is it your favorite subject? Um, if you have a least favorite subject, why is that your least favorite? Um, why do you participate in a particular activity, whether it's a sport or music, um, a club in your high school, a job, whatever it is that you participate in, why have you chosen to do that and why do you continue to do that? Why did you choose to stop participating in something? Thinking of the opposite of things is equally important. Not only what you like, but what you've realized that you dislike is very important for the self-reflection. Why are you considering a, a potential career choice? Why did you initially get interested in, in a certain career or a certain major? To what extent does name recognition of a school matter to you? To some students, it's very important. And to other students, they've realized that there's other factors that are important to them. And how does financial value play a role in your decision making? This is another important thing for you to think about. The self-reflection, I tell my students, is really important throughout high school. I know we have students of all different grade levels who are participating this evening. We maybe have students as young as ninth grade and students all the way to 12th grade. 
you can do this self-reflection throughout your high school experience. I'm not saying that every day you need to sit down and have a big heart to heart with yourself, but periodically give yourself a little space, a little time to think about what's important to you, to think about what you really feel passionate about, to think about what truly matters to you. Um, if there's a particular subject that you really enjoy at school, key into that subject and try to understand what it is about that subject that you love and maybe even a particular unit that you're studying that you like. Example, a lot of students say they're interested in biology, but biology is a big topic. It could be everything from cellular biology to plant biology, human biology, animals. Um, so if you're taking biology as one of your high school classes and you love it, what particular topic really gets you excited? What did you love learning about when you took that class? That's all going to fall under the self-reflection piece. Um, open dialogue is critical. Uh, family members really need to have a conversation. This isn't done in a vacuum. It's not a private situation between the student and their um, high school counselor or a student and their independent counselor or a student and their friends. Students and parents need to have these conversations together. They need to talk about um, how they can define success in this process, areas of strength, of growth. Um, parents can talk about their own college experiences or their expectations about college. We may have some families where parents are first or where students would be first generation college. So they don't necessarily have parent experiences that they can rely on and talk about. Um, and so just having conversations about college in general is really important. Also talking about finances is critical. Understand how and if your family can financially support you. Make realistic choices based on these conversations. There's a wonderful tool called the Net Price Calculator that you can access on all of the college websites. And you can use this to get a rough estimate of what your um, payment, what, what your sticker price might be for a particular university. I think this is a great way of thinking about it. You as a student owns the process, but your family needs to be part of the conversation. So as you're doing your research, there are a lot of tools that are available to you and a lot of things to think about. So again, going back to that self-reflection that you may have done, I want you to think about your preferences and how you might prioritize them. Think about your academic likes and dislikes, your favorite activities and organizations, and what may be critical for you to have at your future home, um, future career interests and plans, location, your value system and how the university might support that. And you can also think about whether you want to start completely new or continue with certain comforts of your current life. You can think about your priorities in different categories. What are your must-haves? What's absolutely essential to you at your future college? What would you like to have? And what, what do you really not care for? Like what might be a deal kill at a certain school? Um, there are tremendous resources online that you can take advantage of. Um, Big Future is a website that I like. And actually, when Crystal's talking, I'll go ahead and put some of these into the chat so that you have them to hang on to. So Big Future is a great resource that's run by the College Board. It's a really good search engine for just getting an initial sense of schools. Um, there are also college websites, there are other lists that you can generate. There's a ton of information on the web. One of my favorite things that came out of COVID is that because students couldn't physically visit campuses, colleges moved their resources of campus visits online. Nothing fully substitutes for an actual visit to campus, but if you want to sit in the comfort of your house in your pajamas and visit campuses across the country and not spend the time or the resources of visiting places, you can do an online virtual visit. You can take a campus tour, you can do an information session. There's often specific sessions for certain um, programs that students can take advantage of. So definitely going online to the college websites is really helpful. There are some books that I love. I'm 
I'm a little bit old school about things. I still think books can be incredibly helpful. Um, you can visit your local library, you can spend time in a local bookstore, or you can choose to purchase these books. Um, the Fisk Guide to Colleges, I think is terrific. Colleges That Change Lives is another book that I love. And The College Finder is another book that's incredibly helpful. There are also tools that your high schools may have. Those could include Naviance, Score, and Maya Learning. Um, and these are additional tools that are available to you as a high school student. Um, if you're not sure how to use those programs, please contact your high school to get that information. Your school counselors, um, the guidance administrative staff, they can walk you through that process. Um, <clears throat> it's important that as you build your list, you work to create balance. Um, I know one of the questions that, that families often ask is how many schools should a student apply to? I typically recommend that a student apply to six to eight colleges. Now, this is assuming that you've done your research, that you've carefully considered the schools that you might apply to. I have other colleagues who recommend 10, eight to 10, or 10 schools, or 10 to 12 schools. Um, different people give different recommendations. I do not think that students need to be applying to 20 schools. Um, I think you need to do your research to narrow things down. Ideally, you'll have one to two reach schools. I, go, I often call these lottery ticket schools because it's almost like buying a lottery ticket for admission. You're reaching for admission to those places. You should have six to seven target options. That's where you would fall into the middle 50% or higher of the reported GPA or the reported test scores. Um, and that's information you can often find on school websites. And then you should have two to three schools that fall under the likely category. Um, we want you to ensure great op outcomes no matter the results. So you should be excited about all of your schools that you've applied to. And you shouldn't apply to places that you're really not interested in attending. You should continue to do that research until you find schools that you're excited to attend. Um, you should seek feedback on your list. Your school-based counselor can be very helpful. An independent college counselor like myself can help you with the process. Teachers, mentors, family, friends. Again, you shouldn't do this process completely in a vacuum. There are a lot of resources available and a lot of people who can help you with things. Now you wanna be able to stand out for all the right reasons. You wanna think about, as you're putting together your application, how you want colleges to see you and what you want to highlight in your application. What's most important about yourself and your high school experience that you want to get across? I often tell students that your application can almost be like a marketing piece about yourself. There's obvious limitations to that. You can only provide the information that the colleges request in the application. And I know that Crystal's gonna to touch on that a bit more, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but you have tremendous flexibility when you think about the essay topics that you choose to write, um, how you frame yourself in the application process and the information that you include. Make sure that you follow directions. Remember my guidance from the beginning. Complete the application fully. Read everything carefully. I can't stress that enough. And proofread. I have seen students spend hours and hours on applications and I still find mistakes. I still find misspellings. I still find incorrect words. I still even find um, things that, that they just really shouldn't have included or information that's incorrect. So make sure that you proofread. Ask someone you trust to proofread your application for you before you submit it. Again, organization is critical, um, <clears throat> so, so keep that in mind. Um, recognize that everyone has strengths and areas of improvement. Your goal in your application is to highlight your strengths and downplay your areas that are not strengths. Um, you wanna be able to use the, the application in that way. And you want to tell your story. You want to tell the story of you, not the story of somebody else that you know, not the story that you think the admission counselors want to hear. Authenticity is critical in this process. Being your authentic self is absolutely 
what we want to see and what admission counselors want to see when they review your application. So use the essay to your advantage. Use the additional information section of the common application if you need it. Um, ask your counselor or teacher to include certain information in your recommendation letters. If there are stories or anecdotes or things that you think are really important to be included, you can absolutely suggest that to your recommenders. And make sure you fill in the gaps. Um, don't force admission counselors to make assumptions or to guess about why things happened a certain way. Admission counselors are human. We're normal people. I hope that you realize that after this presentation today. I used to be an admission counselor. Crystal is an admission counselor. We are nice, normal people. And we understand that not everything always goes smoothly for students. And we understand that there's circumstances and life gets in the way and things happen. If there is additional information that you want to provide, provide it in, in that additional information section. Talk to your um, school counselor, or um, a private counselor that you've hired to help you to explain things that you want to provide explanations about. And believe in yourself. You can do it. You can do this process. I have faith in you. Students have been doing this for a long time. Yes, we feel more stressed about it now because it's all over the internet. It's all over social media. People are talking about it. When you get to the point that your kids are applying to college, you feel like it's the only thing that anyone is talking about, but you can absolutely do this. And there are lots of resources to help you to accomplish those goals. So I'm gonna turn things over to Crystal. I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna turn over to Crystal and she will pick it up from here. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you all uh, for being here this evening. I really appreciate the break from reading applications. Uh, we are rounding out our admission cycle here at CWRU. And so it's great to be with you all as you start with your, uh, start thinking about college, no matter if you are a ninth grader or going into your senior year. Um, I'm gonna be giving you an inside look on what I do every day and kind of breaking it into parts. And so first and foremost, you are more than your GPA. Uh, this is a look inside of holistic review. And what holistic review means is that all parts of your application play a part in making an admission decisions. So a little bit about, about me is that I have, I've been around for a while and I've worked at a lot of different institutions, liberal arts. I now work at a tier one private research university. I'm going back to the liberal arts world uh, come May, but I've also been on the high school side. And so I've guided or helped guide students through their admission process. So I, um, I, I bring a, a perspective that, that I hope that you find useful. I did include a little bit of like college journey. So I've been where you are. I have, um, it is, it is the quite unique and there are questions about it, happy to help, but giving you an idea of who I am and a little bit of my background as we get started. So before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about just the college landscape. Uh, there are over 5,000 colleges in the United States, and I think people get lost in uh, talking about a really, really small group of, of colleges that are often seen on TV or often listed in U.S. News and World Report. Uh, but but take it, taking a minute to think about what number or what percentage of colleges or universities that that represents is less than 5%. Um, well, less than 5% of, of this 5,300 colleges are this highly selective or selective institutions. And what selective admission means is that colleges are getting more applications than they have room to admit. So they have to make decisions. Uh, holistic review means that it's not just a GPA, it's not just a, a test score that is, that is getting us to an offer of admission or a non-offer of admission, but all parts of the application matter. And we're talking about those parts of the application. Uh, this is just a, a general overview of what we see on, on our end as we are going through applications. So the first and foremost is your personal information. You're gonna fill it out, tell us a little bit about your background, your parents' background, um, 
you're going to list your activities, you're going to write your essay. Uh, some colleges are going to have supplemental essays. These are additional essay questions or short answer questions that they would like for you to answer. Some of them are really fun. You know, what book are you reading? What's your favorite author? Some are more, uh, more specific about why are you interested in our university? And so those play a part in, in the admission decision. We certainly look at how you're spending your time outside of the classroom and your extracurricular list, uh, your transcript, uh, is sent by your college counselor. We also have your secondary school report and your school profile. Uh, I give this homework every time I speak. If you do not know what I'm talking about when I talk about a school profile, I will touch on it a little bit later in the presentation, but your job is to go to your high school and ask your high school for the profile that is sent with college applications. It gives us information about the high school. Um, you should be aware what we're seeing. It also will, um, it also will give you some more information about the, the types of, of important academics, the testing, just information about your school that you may or, be, may or, may, or may not be acquainted with. Uh, testing is a part of the, of the application, whether or not you're applying to a test optional school, if you're taking AP courses, if you've taken the SAT or the ACT, if you've chosen to report that, we receive it there. We also would be receiving a counselor recommendation as well as teacher recommendation. So all of those pieces go into answering basically three questions. All colleges and universities across the country want these three questions answered as we, as we are making decisions. And the first and most important question is, can you be academically successful on our campus? How and what will you contribute to our community and are you a good fit for our community? And that fit is social, it could be financial, it could be cultural, it could be a wide array of, of responses. But these are the three main questions that, that we're looking for as we review your application. So the first question is, can you be academically successful on our campus? And to answer that question, we're looking at your transcript, we're looking at your testing, if you provide it, we're looking at, we're looking at your teacher recommendations. So when I started this presentation, I said that you are more than your GPA. And so colleges, we're looking at your transcript and the story that it tells. We're not just taking the GPA off of your transcript. We're looking at the choices that you make curriculum wise. What, were you an honor student? Did you take AP, APs? Were you an IB program? Are you going to a school that has a really robust dual enrollment offering? What's, what's available to you and what classes did you choose to take? Are you taking really rigorous courses in certain areas? Does that relate to what you want to do on our campus? Um, we're basically, we're looking for that four-year story that a transcript tells. Were you a student who it took a while to get um, acclimated to high school? Are you a student who's always been a 4.0 student? Are you a student who kind of, you know, hit your stride as you were getting, um, as you were progressing through high school? Are you a student who's always excelled in certain areas? Whatever the case is, we're looking beyond the, the GPA that's listed. So, uh, and then the context matters. A lot of times, you know, people are always thinking about, well, I go to this school and this school is really hard. Does it matter that my GPA is this when if I went to a school down the road or across town, my GPA would be higher? Uh, we don't make those assumptions. We can only review what we see. And so you are reviewed in the context of your high school, which is the school profile. That's how we know. So when I look at a transcript, the very next thing I'm looking at is your high school profile, which is the, basically the legend of understanding your community, what's offered, um, what kind of curriculum does your school have? Do they have restrictions on honors or APs or dual enrollment courses? Whatever the story is, that school profile helps me answer it. Um, so those are some things to think about, but the context, who you are as a student in your high school context is really important to us. This is where we might find your, your school ranking. This is where we really understand the grades and the choices that, again, that you're making as you're, as you're progressing through your high school experience. 
So this question about testing. So, you know, are you going to be successful on our campus? We have your GPA. We have the story that it tells. Another piece of that can be testing. And so it's your SAT. And I talk about testing in this instance in regard to the SAT or the ACT. We don't have a preference of which test that you take. Uh, but as you are taking those tests, I really would encourage you to take the time and understand what that score says. Uh, if you're taking the SAT, you're going to get a, a reading portion, you're going to get a math portion. If you're going to take the ACT, it's uh, broken up a little bit differently. But what is a story, again, that your test tells? Are you stronger in reading? Are you stronger in math? Are you thinking about being an engineer? Hopefully your math score is high. Uh, if you're thinking about a career or studying social sciences or humanities, what is your reading score tell or your writing score tell about, about your, your uh, academic potential, so to speak. So think about how you did overall. Think about how you did in the sections. Um, relate that score to your transcript. Are you a student who, again, has been a really, really strong student who's been taking APs and honors and dual enrollment courses? And does your score kind of tell that story? Are you a student who has maybe struggled with standardized testing or you're not you haven't had the time to, to really prepare um, or take review, whatever the case is, it's more about the context of that score. There's not one score that I would definitely say, yes, you should report it. Um, again, and this the holistic review is not just your GPA, is not just your score that helps get us get to an admission decision. It's uh, about the entire pieces of the puzzle. Uh, I did want to touch a little bit on uh, APs and IBs. If you are going to a school that has an IB curriculum, you'll start taking those HLs or SL exams. You'll be taking AP exams. Do those scores help make your case, help answer the question of your preparation of being successful? Uh, just very quickly, when I think about uh, from, from the CWRU lens, from that highly selective lens, typically fours and fives are saying, yes, you're going to be, you're, you're performing at a really high level. You're earning college, college um, credit as you take those APs. Or if you're taking an IB curriculum, sixes and sevens in HL courses kind of answer that question. Uh, threes are passing an AP exam. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page there. And then this, this world of test optional. Uh, are we really test optional? What does test optional mean? What scores should I be submitting? Uh, this is very important. And no matter what year you are, I would say take a test, take a standardized test, take the, either the ACT or the ACT. Give yourself the option of having a score to report. Whether or not you report that score is entirely up to you. It's entirely up to, to where you are applying. Some colleges are, are ending their pilot program. Some colleges are still evaluating their test optional. Some, some colleges are, are saying, we do want those test scores. So make sure that you're taking a test so you have the option. And then thinking about test optional is test optional in regards to AP IB curriculums. But if you're, again, taking an AP curriculum, do you have the scores that can, that can help um, answer the question, can you be successful? Whatever the situation is, it's really important to know that you are more than your score and you just make sure that your list, this is where Lisa was talking about college list is so important, is making sure that you are making sound decisions based on where, where you are applying, um, it, it plays a part. So, so you've talked about, I've talked about GPA, I've talked about testing, and talking a little bit about why teacher recommendations matter. These are the people that know you best. They see you every day. Um, hopefully you have asked people who know you well and that can write good things about you. Uh, that's so critical when you're, when you're talking about teacher recommendations. They're gonna talk about who you are as a student, uh, how you come into class, your attitude. Are you coming prepared? Did you do your homework? Are you working hard in their class? Are you asking questions? Are you participating? In, in the conversation? Do you work well with other students? Are you um, responsible and coming to class on time? Are you um, helping your peers? 
these are some things that we like to hear. If you're a good student in high school, the odds are you're gonna be a good student when you get to college. And our faculty like teaching good students, no matter what college or university you're talking about. Uh, perhaps you are thinking about a class where you may have struggled and that's okay. Uh, that's okay when you have, again, a teacher that can write on your behalf that knows you well and talk about, you know, you struggled in this subject, but you went to, you went to office hours, you asked for help, you did extra work, you advocated for yourself, you really improved with a lot of effort. That's a great story to tell. Um, so maybe you're a straight A student, maybe you're a student that, that's had more, more uh, challenges. Whatever the case is, people can write great things about you, no matter what your GPA is or your, your, your grade is in that particular class. Um, your personality, that's going to be approached on in your teacher recommendations. Are you coming in with positive attitude? Are you a person who is coming in ready to learn? Um, are you showing respect for others? Are you interacting well with other people? All of those things hopefully are going to be uh, relayed to us in, in, your, in your application or in your teacher recommendations. Again, last, last but not least, make sure that they have good things to say about you. And that's perfectly okay when you are asking people to write on your behalf is making sure they can say good things. And I just harp on that because I read a lot of applications. So that was the first question. How can you, are you gonna be academically successful on our campus? And then the next question was, what are you going to contribute to our campus? And these questions are answered typically through your extracurricular list. Um, those contributions, they tell us about your interests. They your activity list tells us about your leadership experience. They tell us about your commitment. Are you a student who's involved in a lot of things that's tried a lot of things in high school? Are you a student who has really focused in, you know, maybe community service, maybe athletics, maybe theater, whatever the case is, we're gonna ask you to quantify it. We're gonna ask you to write down those involvements. And then we're gonna ask you to think about the number of hours per week and the weeks per year that you've been involved in those activities. There is no right answer to this question, but we really looking for students who have had a commitment to two activities. Perhaps it's one or two things. Perhaps they have one or two main activities. Perhaps they have a job. Maybe they're taking care of younger, younger siblings or older relatives. Whatever the case is, the overall thing that we're looking for is that you have been engaged in your high school community. Um, your extracurricular list tells us about your ability to manage your time. It tells us about your sense of responsibility, and it tells us about your interaction with your peers. Again, if you were involved in high school, the likelihood of you being involved uh, when you get to our campus is incredibly high. So your application, that, that personal information is telling us a little bit about your background, where you come from. Maybe you're a first-gen student, maybe both of your parents have professional jobs, whatever the case is, it kind of paints the picture of, of your background. Um, perhaps you are, you are uh, coming in with a certain perspective on life or a certain perspective of socioeconomic status. Whatever the situation is, the application and how you are answering those initial questions are helping us um, paint a picture of who you are. Um, any special talents or interests or experiences, those are gonna be, be relayed in your application. And then it helps us understand your story. Uh, my job, my staff's job is to make sure that you're coming um, off the page a bit and that you're just, again, you're more than a GPA, you're more than a transcript. We really wanna understand um, where who you are and where you're coming from as you're applying to our university slash college. Uh, the college essay. This is the only time typically that a high school student gets to talk directly to an admission committee. My staff has people that just graduated from college and they have people that have been in this field for over 30 years. Um, so the essay is really a piece where you get to talk directly to the admission committee. Uh, we're looking to see that it's well written, that you're showing us that you are ready for college level writing, um, but we also want to hear your voice. We want to hear from you what's made you you, what's important to you, uh, whatever the case is. This is probably my most favorite part of, of reading applications. 
uh, it gives us a little bit of insight into the student, into the person that's going to be on our campus, in our dorm rooms, going to be teammates. Uh, so those are things that we're looking for in your essay. Is it well written? And are you showing us a little bit about who you are? Care enough to proofread. So you've shown us you can su succeed on our, in our classrooms. You've shown us that you're going to contribute to our campus. And then are you a good fit for our, for our campus or our community? And the parts of the application that help us answer those questions are going to be your counselor recommendation, any supplemental essays that may or may not be required, and then an interview if you've had the opportunity to do so. So your teachers are talking about who you are in the classroom. Your counselor recommendation is talking about who you are in the context of your high school. So what type of student you are, what type of activities you've been involved in, what your reputation is at your high school. And so it helps us understand who you are in context of your high school um, as a student, as a person, as a community member, and then typically your counselor recommendation will fill any blanks or answer any questions that may have come up, um, maybe on your transcript, maybe there was a blip, whatever the case is, uh, the counselor recommendation again is writing on behalf of the school. Um, very quickly, if you are given the opportunity to interview, do it. Uh, take the time to, to have that conversation. Often it's a chance to meet with one of our community members. Uh, Certainly we're gonna ask you questions, but it also gives you a chance to answer questions about, about the college, the, the community, the culture, whatever your questions are, the academics that you're interested in. Uh, it gives us a, a chance to get to know you. It puts a face to your name. Again, it gives you a chance to make your case as a student, as a person, as a community member, maybe answer any questions or address anything that you may want an admission committee to know and that conversation goes better in person. Um, some students, some colleges and universities are gonna care about that um, in, in their admission process. So uh, bottom line, if you're given the opportunity to do so, uh, make sure that you are taking the college up on it. So how do you stand out in our applicant pools? Uh, first, make sure you have a college list that fits you. That's so important. What do you want? What do you need? What, what college or university will best serve you academically, socially, financially. Make sure you have a reason to apply to that college other than you see it on TV, other than it's highly ranked. You, you know why you're applying to that college. If you're admitted, you'd be really excited to attend. Um, those are really critical when you're thinking about standing out. If you're excited about an institution, that's gonna come across in everything that, that we are reading in your application. Uh, create a narrative for your application. Um, we certainly care about what you're thinking about majoring in. We uh, want to understand the choices that you made academically, extracurricularly. Uh, it helps us understand maybe how you would fit in our, in our campus or on our campus. Uh, touting your strengths and accomplishments. You all are very accomplished people. You have things to, to celebrate. Make sure that you're, you're mentioning those in your college applications. Capitalize on your talents, whether you're an athlete or you're a volunteer, whether you are a student leader, whatever the case is, now is your time to really, to really capitalize on those interests, those passions. Um, ask the right people to write on your behalf. Rely on the experts. Um, people who do this professionally, I would call them experts. Uh, be you and then make sure you proofread. And then this is my final slide and then we'll go to Q and A. Um, your job right now is to be the best high school student you can be, not a pre-college student. Um, so make sure that you're taking advantage of all the opportunities that you have in your high school, wherever you go, uh, as far as academics, as far as extracurriculars, as far as getting involved. Um, those are the things that we're gonna care about when it comes time for you to apply, no matter where you are. So that's it. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Crystal. Thank you, Lisa. I we definitely appreciate your insights. We have some questions. Um, what are the pros and cons of early decision or early action? Lisa, you want me to take that? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, 
there is no better way to tell a, a university or college that you're interested than than applying early decision. Early decision is not for everyone. It's a very personal conversation. When we're talking about it from the purely from the selective or highly selective admission world, um, you give yourself the best opportunity just mathematically if you apply early decision or early action. When you're going around asking colleges and universities acceptance rates, you're going to find there's a trend. The earlier you apply, the better your options, uh, the better your chances of being admitted. Um, and so that's that's my answer. What are the negatives of applying for early decision or early action? And does it yeah. affect financial aid? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. So um, I will say this. So making sure everyone understands the difference between early decision and early action. Early decision, you can only apply to one school early decision at a time. At most, you can apply to two schools if you didn't get into your first choice ED. Um, if you get in, is financially affordable for you and your family, you are committed to that institution. That's early decision. Um, the drawback is if you are a family that is looking for the best deal uh, financially, you're not gonna have the opportunity to weigh your options. So that's, that is ED. Uh, early action, you apply early, the college acts on your application early, but you have until May 1st to decide if that's gonna be the place where you're not. Um, basically, the advantage is we act on your application early. There's typically no drawback of applying early action. There are a handful of institutions that have restricted, but that's way in the weeds. Thank you. Um, could one of you explain what an unweighted GPA is? It seems sure. that colleges ask for unweighted GPAs. So weighting um, has to do with the rigor of the courses you're taking. So if you look at your transcript, your high school transcript, your grades will appear unweighted. That's the grade that you're getting for the course. It might be an A, it might be a 95, it might be a 7. It depends on your high school's grading system and the curriculum that you're doing. But the grade that we see on a transcript is an unweighted grade. The weighting comes in when we determine the GPA. So some high schools will provide students with a weighted GPA, which means that you're getting extra credit and extra bonus points for taking an honors or an AP or an IB course. Some high schools provide their students with both a weighted and an unweighted GPA. Um, other schools do one or the other. It, again, this is why the profile is so important because when you're sitting and reading hundreds and thousands of applications, you need to understand each particular student within the context of their own high school. And so the profile gives you that information. If you want to determine your unweighted GPA, just average together your grades in all of your classes and divide by the number of classes you've taken. Don't average in um, electives. Don't average in your PE classes. I had to explain to a family recently that even though their son got 100 in PE, it's not going to affect his college um, admission GPA. Um, so that's basically how would, you would do it. And if your high school uses a letter grade system and you're not sure how to assign those numbers, you can just Google it and you can get an easy explanation of how to do that. Your profile, your school profile should also have your, your grading scale. I would also say that as you're going through your search, particularly for juniors, ask the question. Ask the question to the colleges and universities that you're applying to. Do they take the GPA unweighted or weighted GPA in, in terms of making a decision? Are there different academic requirements for admission depending upon the major that you are choosing? You wanna go, Crystal? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so that is a, it depends kind of question because a lot of our colleges and universities across the country are gonna approach this differently. Um, I would say that if you're interested in STEM areas, you know, we're gonna care a whole lot about how you perform in, in math and science. If you are interested in English, the humanities, the social sciences, that's gonna open up um, those, those requirements a little, a little bit as well. Um, basically, we're looking for people that have had you know, four years of English, four years of math, four years of science, particularly if you are applying to, again, these highly selective or selective institutions, 
um, that does make a difference. And then each college is going to going to respond differently or react differently to to those requirements as you apply. You've talked about the different components that the colleges look at in evaluating whether to admit a candidate. Is there a different weight given to each of these areas? That's Absolutely. Same, or, 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 you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, no. I, I would say, based on my experience over all these years, your transcript is the most important. It's the single best indicator of your ability to be successful at a college or university. If you have, even if you have other factors, you know, where you've been successful, if you're applying to these most selective or selective colleges, they want to see that you've been successful in the classroom. Um, so I tell students it's a, a pie, but it's not divided equally. So transcript comes first. Um, from an academic perspective, if you send testing, obviously that gets considered on the academic side. I would say extracurricular activities in your essay also count considerably. Um, teacher recommendations are important, but if I was going to rank things, I would maybe put mm -hmm. those lower, um, just because you don't always have the context of the entire picture. Um, and again, if you choose not to send testing, each of those pieces of the pie is going to get a little bit bigger and it's going to count a little bit more. I agree with that. Your transcript is the most important. It tells a four-year story. What are the biggest mistakes you see parents make as they attempt to support their child during the admissions process? Writing their kid's essay. 100%. <laughs> that was a very quick answer was by very good. Uh, you. 100%. Um, the other is pretending to be the student and contacting us. Um, <laughs> we, I've read thousands of applications. I know what a 17, 18, 19 year old sounds like. And I know what a, um, a, a college educated professional sounds like on the phone, an email, an essay form. Um, but, you know, kind of taking over their search is, is one of the biggest mistakes I, I see. Um, what types of fees should we expect for admissions? Is this, I, I'm assuming this question is in regards to the application yes. amount. Uh, it's a range. It could be as little as 25. It could be free. It could be $25. It could be 50. It could be 75. Um, those are those are the typical application fees that, that we see, but it's going to vary institution to institution. What should my ninth grader be doing now to help him or her when it's time for the application process? I think ninth grade, like my key word for ninth grade is transition. It's a big transition year. Even if you're a student who's gone to the same school or will go to the same school K through 12, um, ninth grade is still a transition. There's different expectations in the classroom. There's different expectations extracurricularly. I see ninth grade as an opportunity to like get your bearings, figure out who you are, what you're interested in, try different things, use that year to just figure out how to do high school, you know, be, be, as Crystal said, like be the best high school student you can be. That's what you should be thinking about in ninth grade. You do not need to be thinking about specific colleges, filling out applications, stressing about things. Um, what I feel the most important part of my job is, is helping families to realize there are things to worry about today things to worry about tomorrow, and things that can be worried about far in the future. And for a ninth grader, it's really just about being a high school student. Okay. What are your thought process regarding AP classes and CCP classes? How do they compare for the admissions process? Yeah, it depends on the context of the school. This is not a, a one answer fits all kind of, kind of question. Um, this is really, you know, I, I think a question that I would go back to your school and I would go back to your school profile and, and see, you know, what are the strongest students in your school doing? You know, where are they going to college? What choices are they making? If your school has a really strong AP curriculum and uh, is preparing students for success um, routinely, like that could be a great option. You know, perhaps you are a family that can't afford or doesn't want to pay the the AP costs, you know, dual enrollment is often a really great choice. 
is also thinking about what are what are your aspirations and where are you thinking about going um, going to college because it's going to be approached differently at different places. Are you trying to get out of college as soon as possible? Um, those are going to be some of the questions I would ask as you're as you're kind of weighing weighing your options. One is not better than the other, uh, but we are going to be considering what we see on your transcript in the context of your school. I think as a follow up to Crystal, it's also what your plans are for the future and and in some ways thinking about where you might be going to college, what kind of schools you might be considering. Are you staying in state? Are you going out of state? I think those become interesting factors. Um, when I worked at Wash U, we had a rule and many of the selective colleges do that in order to receive college credit for a high school course, the course must be taught on a college campus by a college professor and you don't receive high school credit for the course. And so that AP courses are treated differently. Um, and you may be able to earn AP credit, whereas a dual enrollment class, you might not be able to get it the same way. So again, it's it's very much what Crystal was saying. There, there just isn't like one clear answer we can give, which I know must be frustrating on the parent side or on the student side, but it's considering all of these different factors and thinking about it accordingly. Thank you. The college admissions process can cause a lot of, a lot of anxiety for both parents and students. What are the top things we should tackle to have a great admissions application? I think to have a good experience, you, you have to plan ahead. You have to use time management skills. Um, you have to figure out, again, like I was saying, what you need to worry about right now, what you can push off to, to a different time. There are lots of tools online that might be able to help give you the sense of a timeline. There are people you can rely on in your community who can help you to figure out the timeline of things. Um, and I really think, so time management and communication would be my keywords for, for getting through this process. Um, I, I would say a lot of those things, Lisa. I would also say, being realistic in terms of just thinking about, you know, who you are as a student, um, what's appropriate, like what your college was, is it appropriate for, for you? Um, what are your overall aspirations? What's realistic about your financial picture and what your family is able to afford? Um, your college decision is a very personal um, and family oriented decision. And so again, having that really good communication about kind of what are what your goals are uh, for college, what you're hoping for in a in a, an experience, what you're hoping to do after college, but also understanding that again, there are over five thousand colleges and universities in the country, and we tend to get lost in these um, this very small group of, of really really selective colleges. But the education that you get where you go. The most important thing that happens is what you do when you get to those institutions um, and not the bumper sticker on your car. Is following up on one of the comments that you just made, Crystal, about um, a, a college that's financially appropriate, is financial aid a separate process from admissions? Oh, well, that could be a whole nother topic. <laughs> um, there are different types of financial aid, and I'm going to tackle this in overarching um, kind of kind of content. Um, when we're talking about financial aid, everywhere is going to treat it differently. And I think there is um, scholarship dollars, and so like Case Western Reserve, when you apply to the university, you're considered for merit scholarships. Some of our peers don't do merit scholarships like we do. Um, that's that's considered part of financial aid for a lot of our students. There's need-based financial aid, and that is um, whatever your family's financial circumstance is, if there's financial need, a college like Case Western, like a Wash U, we meet 100% of your demonstrated financial need based on how you fill out um, the financial aid forms. It's not based on what you want to pay for college, it's based on uh, what your financial circumstance is as it pertains to those forms that are required. Um, there's also there's also some some institutions that 
make admission decisions based on financial that maybe need aware what your financial need is. There are some institutions that are need blind as they make admission decisions. But those are questions to ask the colleges that you're interested in as you start looking through through your search. Lisa, did, I, I don't know if I hit everything. Oh yeah, 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 you hit it really well. I mean, again, it's very specific to, to each individual college. And I think dividing it into categories of like merit-based versus financial need and, and knowing that there is, is pretty extensive paperwork that you need to fill out for the financial needs side. And you need to be very much aware of those deadlines. You do not want to miss a deadline because you may miss out on significant financial aid. There's no deadline after the deadline. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you to, the, to uh, the participants who joined. And I really appreciate uh, Lisa and Crystal, you joining us tonight. We hope to the parents and students that you'll feel more comfortable facing the life challenge of college admissions uh, with more confidence after tonight's presentation. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. And then don't.